So 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Uh, last week, we covered a whopping three verses, you know. Uh, some weeks are like that. Uh, uh, this week, we'll, we'll be able to cover more than, uh, than three verses. But First Thessalonians chapter 3, what I do want to do, though, is I would like us to um, just pick up in uh, verse 1 and read over those first three verses here as we enter into where we're going to begin, where we're going to uh, uh, pick up. Um, this morning. So if you just read along with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 1, um, therefore when we could no longer endure it, the apostle Paul said, when we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy, our brother and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. That's the Thessalonican uh, church, the church in Thessalonica, to establish you and encourage you in your faith and concerning your, your faith, that no one should be shaken by these afflictions, for you yourselves know that we are appointed to this. And as we shared last week, the difficulties and the uh, afflictions and hardship and all dealing with the persecution, which was so heavy there in the early church, and, and persecution has always uh, been uh, there uh, from the inception of the church, very strong uh, in the early church age, and unfortunately, it is very strong again today in recent times, such an an uptick in that. And those that are struggling and those that are going through forms of persecution, you know, I I think of of even, uh, and it's a different form of persecution, you know, but uh, those that are dealing with that on the job, those that are dealing with that with their businesses, and, and there's those that are coming against them and, and lawsuits because they are who they are as Christians and are standing by their, their, their uh, biblical standards to not compromise the Word of God in the workplace. That you know that, that as a Christian, we are a Christian when we leave this place, and it's not just when we're in this place, okay? In fact, it's probably even more important that we are... Uh, walking that walk, and not just talking the talk, but walking that walk when we're out of this place. It's easy to live the Christian life when we're here among brothers and and sisters. It's much harder when you're on the freeway and someone cuts you off and flips you off, okay? It's a lot harder when you're at work and you're dealing with that, that difficult a co-worker or, or whatever. It's, it's difficult when, when uh, you're perhaps a business owner and there are those that are coming against you because of how you are running your business in a way that is honoring and glory, glorifying to God. But we are a Christian outside of this place and inside of this place, that it is who we are called to be. When the Holy Spirit comes and takes up residence in our lives and we've been born again and we go out into the world and we should look different, not physically like, th- like this, but I mean in our, the, the way that we look at life, the way that we conduct ourselves, the conversations that we have. And I'm saying all that because we need that encouragement. It's so important It's so important to encourage others. And here we're talking about the encouragement of a church that was, you know, with the the persecution and all in in the area going through it. And they're young believers, young, in other words, in their time with the Lord. They're new believers. How much more they need that encouragement? Every one of us does. And it can be hard going through any form of persecution, whether you're, you're uh, new in the Lord or whether you've known the Lord for a long time. But I, I see the point here, the, some of the difficulties and, and, and all 
uh, with those that are uh, newer in the faith, and you're just wanting to make sure that they're, that they're rooted in, and established and all. And the enemy loves to come along and, and do his, his dirty deeds. And so that's what all of this is about and has been about for the past couple of weeks. That's where we've been here in the Word. He's addressing it head on. Because, hey, we all know that life happens, even as we were praying here uh, this morning about uh, three of the other uh, churches here in town and how they're all sending out these, these prayer requests like I've never seen uh, like that before. And they're just saying, hey, we need prayer. Our church is hurting. Our people are hurting. You know, there's so much going on, and we need to be there. And, and, I, and I told them in, in, in my emails back and forth and it was like hey we're gonna pray we're praying for you guys you know we're here for you guys we're praying for you guys and 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 that is encouragement you know that you know how encouraging it, it is it, you know I, I love and i'm just going to point out mike here as an example you know how mike tells me you know we pray for you every day you know i pray for you every day and i'm like man you know what uh, just the fact that he's praying for me that means so much to me but the but the fact that that i'm aware of that it just shows me love it shows me encouragement. It shows me, hey, I've got your back, you know, in prayer, you know. I'm on, I've got your back on my knees. And, and man, that's so encouraging. And to do that and to be like that for one another, man, we, it, it's just so important. It's so valuable. It's so needed. And so we come up here to uh, verse 4, or verses 4 and 5, I should say. Verses 4 and 5, for in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation just as it happened, and you know. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith. We're just reading about their faith here in verse 2, you know, concerning your faith. In verse 5, I sent to know your faith. He's, he's wanting a, 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 an evaluation, an assessment. Are they sticking with the Lord in the midst of tough times? Are they sticking with the Lord in the midst of trials and tribulations and difficulty and persecutions? I, I sent to know your faith. He couldn't take it anymore. It was driving him crazy. Lest by some means the tempter had tempted you and our labor might be in vain. He wanted to know that our labor wasn't in vain. When we ministered there in Thessalonica, when there were those that were coming to the Lord, when the church was coming together, I want to know now that, that we have had to go to another area, I want you to know that, that I'm praying for you. I want you to know that, that, that we're concerned about you. We're checking in on you. You know, it's so important to do that, to check in on those in the body. You know, hey, if you haven't seen someone in a couple of weeks, hey, are you okay, man? I, 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 I haven't seen you. You know, are you feeling okay? Can I pray for you? Man, it just means so much. There was actually someone... I'm not going to say who. There was someone who uh, Kathy had uh, recently uh, checked in on and, and hadn't seen, you know, in the fellowship in a couple of weeks. And, and you know, she contacted that person. Hey, I just want to make sure that, that you're okay. And, you know, yada. And, and that person had been sick and all. And, and, and this is the sad thing, though. The individual had said to Kathy, in all, and, and th this woman has known the Lord for, you know, decades, you know. I'm going to say probably right around 30 years-ish or so, if I was guessing. And she said, all the years I've been a Christian, no one had ever checked on me to see if I was okay. You know, and I just think to my, and I, Kathy and I were talking about that. And I'm not saying that to, it's not a pat on Kathy's back or it's nothing like that. But I'm just thinking to myself, man, that should not be so in the body of Christ. Like, it should, like, someone shouldn't be surprised if they get a phone call, if they get a, a card in the mail, if they get a text, if they get an email or, or whatever social media things are out there or whatever. But, but someone shouldn't be surprised like, wow, that's never happened before. That should never be like that in the body of Christ, ever. We should be checking on one another. We should be there for one another. And he's checking on them. He had to, to leave Thessalonica, but he's, he's calling on them. How are you guys doing? I'm checking to know your faith, lest by some means a tempter, verse 5, had tempted you, and our labor might be in vain. The apostle Paul, with fatherly love and fatherly care, just couldn't bear not knowing how those new believers were doing. Couldn't bear it. 
Now, tempting is what the tempter, Satan, does. We shouldn't be surprised that the, that the enemy does come to tempt. He loves to bring false reports, too. He loves a false report. We see that all the way back in the book of Genesis. In the early chapters there, he brings false report. He's a liar. He loves to connive. He loves to, to twist things, and he loves a half-truth. He's, he's the, the king of half-truth. He, he puts just enough of truth in something to deceive. And you're like, well, I, that, uh, that's right. And then you think, because, well, that's right, that all the rest that comes with that package is, is right. Be careful. The enemy loves to give partial truths, half-truths. It's a, it's a Trojan horse. And beware. He's a liar, and he's the father of lies. He makes sin look wonderful. And let's admit it. Sin is enjoyable. Maybe you're surprised I'm saying that. Sin is enjoyable. Come on, let's be honest. If it wasn't enjoyable, with as selfish as we are, we wouldn't do it, right? <laughs> but, but it's fleeting. The enjoyment of sin is fleeting. It's just for a moment. It's that, it's that high. It's that one night stand. It's that whatever you want to put to it, you know? But it's fleeting. And the enemy doesn't let you know how that one moment can affect the rest of your life. He's a liar. He's a father of lies. He makes sin look good. He makes what is destructive look somehow beneficial. He tries to make the truth look like a lie, and he tries to make the lie look like the truth. Paul's concern for them was that the hardships that believers were facing at that time would have such an effect on them that perhaps they would walk away from the faith. And he was so concerned. Just as a father would be for a son or a daughter, or a mother would be for a son or a daughter. That concern for them in the faith. And it was like that. Now in verses 6 uh, through 8, <clears throat> it goes on to say, but now that Timothy has come to us from you, so he's, he sent Timothy out there. Go and bring me a report. You know, check on them and encourage them and establish them and all these kinds of things and then come back. Bring me a report. Now that Timothy has come to us from you and brought us good news of your faith and love and that you always have good remembrance of us, greatly desiring to see us as we also to see you. In other words, what he's saying here is the enemy, uh, you are wise to the tri trickery and the lies of the enemy. You are wise to him. And you didn't believe the lies. You didn't believe the, you know, those those, those things that the enemy sets before you to trip you up. Lies about the Apostle Paul. Lies about the ministry. And the enemy loves to just play. Hey, did you hear about that? Do you know that Apostle, you know that, that you know, uh, Timothy, did you hear about, you know, Pastor, so do you know what's going on? In that? And, and the enemy just loves to, to play things like that. Hitler was a master of that. He believed that if you told a lie often enough, that eventually people will believe it because of the familiarity of the lie. It becomes so familiar that it just becomes believable just by the familiarity of it being spoken so much. So it's, it must be true. We see on the media today the same kind of thing. Some of the same lies are, are being told, and it's told so much and across the board that it's easy for someone to just think that, well, that must be the truth because they're all saying it. And you've got to be careful, and you've got to do your homework and, and all. And the enemy loves to bring division. And so he's so happy that the enemy has not divided you from the kingdom, has not divided you 
from fellowship with the greater Christian church and community. A good remembrance of us. Therefore, uh, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, yeah, if you've got your own Bible with you today and you like to mark up your Bible, I, like, I love to mark up my Bible. It makes it so personal. Will you just circle the word in in verse 7? We're going to get back to that. It's a powerful word, in. We, faith is a powerful word, and love is a powerful word, and grace is a powerful word. In, right here, is a powerful word. So, therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. For now we live if you stand fast in the faith. In other words, you, you, it's just brought strength to our bones to know you're okay. Have you ever been in that place? You've been so concerned about the spiritual well-being of another, it's made you sick. Come on, I know a number of you know what I'm talking about. It's a son, it's a daughter, it's a, it's a grandchild, it's a, it's a spouse, it's a, you know, it's, it's a friend or someone, and you're just, you're just so concerned, it's made you sick inside and you just got to know we were comforted concerning you by your faith for now we live if you stand fast in the lord so paul sent timothy to get word of their faith and establish and encourage them and now paul is comforted by that that good news that that's come back what an encouragement to him when we seek others to be ministered to, we ourselves are ministered. Again, when we seek to minister to others, we ourselves are ministered to. In fact, to be very honest with you, I would venture to say that in the varying forms of ministry that I do, that I probably get more, more ministered to in the process of doing it. It's really wonderful how God does that and how God just gives you know, strength to my bones and, 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 and just that encouragement and seeing what he's doing in the lives of, of those around me. Some of my fondest memories are of being a, a teenager and teaching in children's ministry. Some of my fondest ministry uh, are, 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 uh, memories, dealing with four- and five-year-olds, you know? It's wonderful. Or back in my early 20s and and late teens when, when I was on worship teams and uh, in a couple of churches and all. And, and just wonderful uh, memories of those things and a number of things. But, and, and the thing is that I got blessed. I got blessed in serving. In my early 20s, I, I remember I uh, was asked, which was, blew my mind, I was asked to teach a six-week course. I, I, you know, on what? Well, you pray and you see what God leads you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've never done this before. You know, I'm like, are you sure? Are you hearing from you know? And and uh, I called it basic training. And it was honest to goodness. I mean, uh, truly, I was truly like, I'm just this snot nosed kid in the church, and and I was asked to do this, and and it was the largest church, the largest class in the church, even the pastors and the elders, and but this was the largest class. And I'm like. Wow, that's really scary. And I'm saying that because the Lord blessed me in that. I'm like, because, because not that I'm anything, but, but I think what it really was, it was just taking a step of faith. God wants to use us when we take those steps of faith. He wants to use us. And we get blessed when we're used. It's a get to, not a got to. I get to serve. I get to serve the King of kings and Lord of lords. What does the scripture say? I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the temple of my God. If, if, you know, hey, a doorkeeper. Yeah. You know, Bruce and I were, were talking a couple days ago and just talking about how, how fun it is to just greet at a door. It's so fun. I, I, personally, I love you know, giving hugs and shaking hands and, and all of that. It's just, it's, it really is. It's enjoyable to do. It's so good to serve the Lord. And that class, it was just so, it was, it, it, it was just wonderful. And the response that I received from the class, it was ridiculous. And here I am, just this, you know, who am I? And, 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 but God blessed that, that step of faith, a step of faith, a walk of faith, movement in faith, you know, and I, I, it was so encouraging. Reach out and touch somebody. Reach out and touch someone in ministry. 
You know, again, in my in uh, this again was in my uh, early 20s. You know, there was a couple in the church that was having uh, marital problems. And I don't know how it ended up, but but um, we ended up at their house and, and, and ministering to them, you know, and. Uh, and I'm like, who, you know, I'm just this this young guy. I mean, you know, but but you know what? My age didn't matter It was the Holy Spirit It's the Holy Spirit. Don't put it off onto you. Don't make it look like who am I? Be? What, what, who are we? What can we do? We're just but flesh and blood, but we're flesh and blood that's filled with the Holy Spirit of God, okay? And that makes you a super soldier. That makes you a super soldier in the kingdom of God to be used by him. Some of the simplest of, of people. My goodness, you can, you can look at the guys that were on the... the um, uh, the band Love Song back in the, the early 70s there at, at Costa Mesa, you know? And those guys really spurred on so much of the, the Christian artists that we have had through the years, even to today, have been inspired by, by those guys. And those guys were about as simpletons, as simple can be. But they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. Man, it's just so, I, I, honestly, I just think it's so cool. It's so cool. And, you know, speaking about that, that couple and, and me and, and my wife are there and ministering to them and all that kind of stuff. And years later, I still see the fruit of it. I still see the fruit of it. God blessed it and God blessed them. And it's just such a beautiful and a wonderful thing to, to see. And it encourages me. It strengthens my bones, if, if you know what I mean to see those that are walking in the truth and that somehow God uses you, God uses me to be a part of that when we step out in faith. What joy it is to serve the Lord. Incredible joy to serve him. Verses nine through 10. For what thanks, oh, I'm sorry. You know what? I, I, let's go back here. I, I, I didn't mention this one part. Again, verse seven. Therefore, brethren, in all our affliction and distress, we were comforted concerning you by your faith. In it, in their distress, in their trials and tribulations, in their hardships and in their persecution, in the midst of it. It would have been easier for the Apostle Paul to have Timothy with him. But he said, you know what? I'm looking out to them. Hey, we're struggling. We got our, our things going on, the attacks from the enemy and, and all, you know, all these things that we've been sharing. But, but man, there's, a, there's those new Christians over there and they need minister and we got to check on them. His heart, he wasn't so concerned about himself. He was concerned about someone else. And this was the reason why I asked you to circle the word in. He was concerned about someone else in his adversity, not out of it. Hey, it's easy when it's out of it, right? But you don't get as much credit for it, I would assume, you know? It's easier when it's out of it. But when it, you're in it, when you're in the thick of it, that's really the time, really the time that you have the opportunity to incredible Christian growth and maturity. When you don't make it about you, you're concerned about them. And I, I, I'm telling you, I can't tell you how many times it's, it's been rough for me, just like it's been rough for all of us in different times. And somehow, through the power of his Holy Spirit, I, 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 I plug on through. Sometimes you just go through the motions. Sometimes you're not all in, if you know what I mean, and you go through the motions, but it's okay. Go through the motions, because when you go through the motions, God's going to do the work on all the other parts there because you're not giving up, because you're trusting him. What did the psalmist say, but that it was good for me to be afflicted? I don't think he realized that when he was being afflicted. How many of us are like, oh, it's good for me to be afflicted. Afflict me more, you know, like a 21 uh, table game. You know, hit me again, hit me again. Yeah, it's like, you know, bring it on, you know, no. But you know what? But he looks back and he says, it was good. How was it good? Because God brought good out of it in the life of his people, in the life of his church. God brings good. And so affliction can be quite an amazing thing if we seek the Lord in it. God wants to use the affliction in your life. 
to grow you. He's not using it to beat you down. God doesn't beat his kids. He's using it to strengthen you because he knows that the affliction gets our attention. And so in the affliction, in the hardship, even in the things that God allows to come our way from those that seek our harm, in it, we can see the love of God. I pray that you can see the love of God because it's there. It's there. It really is. In all our affliction and distress. Verses 9 and 10. For what thanks can we render to God for you for all the joy with which we rejoice for your sake before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. It's even as we were saying this morning, praying for those that are out sick right now, praying for those that, that have recently had surgeries or that are currently you know, having surgeries and medical procedures and, and those families and all of those that have passed away just in the past couple days in, in some of these other churches here in town, praying that they be strengthened, praying for them, praying for their faith, that their faith be strengthened and all. Verse 10 is accomplished through discipleship. Our Bible says to make disciples. It doesn't really say to make believers. The word believer is just a, I don't know, I, I don't like using that word too much because it's just so abused. I, I kind of look at it like, you know, I was listening to Pastor Jack Hibbs uh, this week, and, and he was saying, I really don't like to use the word Christian anymore. It's just, you know, everyone's a Christian. You know, my dog is a Christian. You know, it's just, you know everyone's a Christian. The fish is, you know, it's, like, it, it's so overly used. What does it mean? Mormons call themselves Christians. All his witnesses will call themselves Christians. New Agers will call themselves Christians. A lot of people call themselves Christians, and it's clear that many of these individuals are clearly not Christians. You know, well, I was born to Christian parents, so somehow that makes, you know, well, you know, it doesn't make you a Christian, you know. Yeah. I was born in a Christian nation. What nation was that? But it's accomplished through discipleship, verse 10 is. The Bible says, make disciples. He, in previous verses, commented on uh, their faith. And here, he shows that they're still growing. And I want you to look at this. Look at this again. You'll see it in verse, uh, verses 5 through 10. He says, I sent to know, your, I had to highlight this. I sent to know your faith. Verse 6 the good news of your faith. Verse seven, comforted concerning you by your faith. Verse 10, that we may see your face and perfect what is lacking in your faith. He's concerned about their faith. He's concerned about where they're at in the Lord. What a wonderful thing to show that kind of love and care and concern. To perfect, now we see here as well. To perfect what is lacking in verse 10 in your faith. To perfect here means to adjust. It means to equip. It means to furnish. Don't settle for status quo Christianity. The Lord has so much more for you. If you'll trust him. If you'll stay the course. I went to a pastor's conference. I don't know, maybe a few years ago now. I lose track from went to one of the senior pastors' conference, and it was uh, titled, Stay the Course. And it was addressed to all these pastors and pastors' wives. Stay the course. Stay the course. It was so encouraging. Stay the course. And to hear some of these guys and what, and what some of these men that I just so look up to, I so respect in the Lord that, that I've just, you know, known for so many years, you know, and, and to hear their trials and tribulations and the craziest things that they're dealing with and, and enduring and they're staying in the course. And it's like, okay, all right, I get that. I get that. And it just is so, it, so good to hear. Stay the course. 
We need to stay the course. Sadly, today, many Christians shortchange themselves. We need to be refreshed, and we need to refresh others. In fact, you'll probably be refreshed as you refresh others in your zeal for more of the Lord and His Holy Spirit, you know. You'll be refreshed. You'll be encouraged. Paul is such an example of what an apostle, a pastor, a leader, a father, and man should be. Like in that no matter what his, his trials are personally, he is always more concerned about the well-being of others. You've got to respect that. You really got to respect that. What made Paul like that? The Lord. Paul took note of the Lord. What made the early church, what made the apostles, disciples like that? The Lord was their example. Didn't even have a pillow for his head. The king of kings endured all that he endured because of his great love for us. And he followed that example. Paul didn't get into the, you know, the woe to me, pity party kind of mentality. He took charge and he turned difficulties into opportunity. You know, I think of Pastor Steve Mays. He was dealing with cancer for for, you know, I don't even know how many years now. He was, you know, of Calvary Chapel South Bay. And, um, and he's one of those men that I just have very high respect for, you know. And, and, you know, the Lord had called him home now. I don't know, I guess maybe a few years ago. But, but to see this man just continue to get behind the pulpit. Pastor Chuck, man, I mean, he just, you know, he just couldn't keep get that man down i mean it's just you know even on pastor's perspective and 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 conferences and this and that and everything it just keeps on keeping on and it encourages me because he saw something greater he saw the the need out there for the gospel to go forth he saw the need of the body of christ to be encouraged hey it's one thing to encourage the body of christ when it's easy in your life but man they're way more encouraged when they see you going through it they can relate to it they can relate to it. It's like when my brother-in-law was tragically killed in that accident on the way to church, you know? And, and I remember, and, and well-meaning people, but somebody, somebody had said, I know what you're going through because, you know, I lost my dog. And, and I'm like, hey, you know, I understand our pets, you know, have a certain place in our heart, but you can't compare your pet. You know, and I just thought you, you don't relate. You, you haven't experienced this and the tragedy of i'll spare you all the details of everything with it and it's just you know and you haven't gone through that and and, and so you know i just thought to myself well you know i take the niceties and everything but but they don't get it you know it's different and you know but 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 when you're going through it and you're ministering to others man it just it's so powerful you know, there's, there's a man who ministers and goes you know all these different churches and everything and he, he's got no arms and no legs Tell you what, somebody like that gets my attention. I want to hear what this guy's got to say. It's just incredible. We can think of Pastor Anthony Evans. He just lost his wife a week ago or whatever, you know? Just lost his wife. And the day after he lost his wife, he was in the pulpit, encouraging and spur spurring on the congregation. Man, you tell me. There probably wasn't a dry eye. I, I watched part of it, and I was holding back the tears. It was amazing to see God use him like that. Just absolutely amazing. I remember personally, you know, and we talk about our difficulties and trials and different things for different people, and, you know, before I was full-time uh, with the church here, I was doing my tent-making job. I was working on the side and working for the church. And I'll tell you what, it's incredibly challenging. On its best day, it is a challenge to 
senior pastor a ministry and all of everything associated with that and be working a job as well. On its best day, it's challenging. And then we were dealing with the last stages and all of my stepdad's Alzheimer's. And we moved my mom and stepdad from Henderson to, you know, 10 minutes down the street and uh, to be there. And, and you know, I'd be, I'd be in a counseling session and get an emergency phone call. Uh, you know, those kinds of things. Um, you know, it was incredibly difficult, incredibly difficult, getting late night phone calls, rushing down there to, to deal with this and to deal with that. And then you know, I have to be up and, and in the pulpit that, you know, in that same morning. And it, it, those things happened a number of times. And then working another job. But I'll tell you what, though, those are the things that, that, that just develop us, develop us as Christians. And I would like to say I'm the better for those things, as difficult as, as they were, you know. Keep your focus on the Lord. And God will allow you to navigate through the things that you need to lab- navigate through in this life and the bumps in the road and all that kind of stuff, but to reach out to others in the midst of your trials. And the apostle is saying, we had it difficult, but we're reaching out because we see that you have a need. That's amazing. Also, well, we've already mentioned verses 5 through 10, as he continues to talk about their faith. And four times Paul recognizes that. Four times he says, your faith, that faith under fire, that faith in action. It's a calling card of a, of a Christian, is that faith. There was one who said, and I quote, our faith is really and truly tested only when we are brought into very severe conflicts. Another had said, you don't know what faith you have until it is tested. A.W. Tozer had said, a Christian who is confident in his or her faith is a result of the confirming work of the Holy Spirit through the word of God. Out of this confirmation comes an authentic faith. It's like our faith is being uh, authenticated. Our faith is being authenticated when we put feet to our faith, when we trust the Lord in such times. Verses 11 through 13. It says, Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another and to all, just as we do to you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in the holiness, in holiness rather, before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints, to abound in love to one another, to establish your hearts blameless in holiness. You know, when we look in verse 12, in this verse, we see that the Lord, it's the Lord's will that his people abound, that his people increase and grow in brotherly love. That may be easier at times than others, I know, but we are to do so, as it says, you know, to all, to all. Loving others, loving, loving those that are difficult is a key to loving people into the kingdom. Loving those that are difficult is a key to loving those into the kingdom. Loving those that are difficult that are in the kingdom is a key to aid in their growth. Love tears down strongholds. Love casts out fear. Love considers others, and it puts others before ourselves. That's true love, because true love is self-sacrificial. 
And it speaks again of Christ. Why would I love someone that's hard to love? I don't know. Why would anybody love me? Because I'm hard to love. You know, I mean, uh, we're all, we all have our difficulties and things. Why would, why would I love someone that's hard to love? Why would I love someone who's rejected me? Why would I love someone who spat in my face, so to speak? Why would I? Because of Christ. Because of Christ. Because Christ loved me. And I'm difficult. Christ loved me. And I spat in his face. Christ loved me. And the stripes that he took, he took because of me. The nails in his hands he took because of me. Because I'm a sinner. But now I'm a sinner saved by grace. His grace gave when I didn't deserve it. And when you didn't deserve it. Can you look to Christ to be that example to you throughout this week? To have that grace, the grace of God that you give lovingly, self-sacrificially to those who around you, around you, who you may say don't deserve it, that's your love project this week. Love on those that don't deserve it because I didn't deserve it. And you, we, don't, we still don't deserve it. But man, isn't that the best demonstration of love? Is to those who don't deserve it? Scripture says it's your kindness that leads me to repentance. Perhaps it's the kindness that people see in us of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God that possibly leads them to repentance. You can be the difference. You can be the difference in their lives. Do you want to be used of God for his kingdom work? Then love the lost and love the church. Love the saints. First Peter, if you look on the screen, chapter uh, 4, verse 8, says, and above all things, above all things, that's a pretty high standard, wouldn't you say? Above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Love will cover a multitude of sins. I love it. Love will cover a multitude of sins. Let's be honest. We struggle with verse 12 here in First Thessalonians at times. But when we live it out, when we do it, we're more Christ-like. Love will cover a multitude of sins. You want to see love in action? Turn to Genesis, if you would. Genesis chapter 9. In Genesis chapter 9, speaking of Noah and his sons, and we'll pick up here in verse 18, if you're taking notes, verses 18 through uh, 23, it says, Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan, (laughs) hence the Canaanites. Remember that when it was time for the Israelites to come into the land, they needed to conquer Canaan. They had to deal with the Canaanites and their idols and false gods and all. Ham was the father of Canaan. He was the father of the Canaanites. Verse, 12, or, uh, uh, verse 19. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard, and then he drank of the wine and was drunk. And he became uncovered or naked in his tent. You know, alcohol makes you do stupid things. <laughs> you know, it, you loosen those, in, those inhibitions and, and whatnot, you know, and, and you, you just do dumb things. I've never seen where alcohol makes anybody any better. I've never seen where alcohol makes any situation any better. Never once. I've never seen it. But then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his 
two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it on both of their shoulders, and they went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. And so they're like, okay, you know, so we're going to take this big, you know, garment, a blanket, you know, whatever this thing is, and, you know, I'm going to drape it this way, and you're going to drape it that way, and we're just going to, you know, just kind of like, you know, walk back like this, and we're not going to look upon the nakedness and the shame of our father, and we're going to cover his nakedness, and we're going to cover his shame. And they took that garment and they did that. Their faces were turned away. They didn't see their father's nakedness. And so Noah, verse 24, awoke from his wine and he knew what his younger son had done to him. And there's a whole bunch of conjecture on that and I'll save it for this morning because I don't want to get off on that at this time. But when Ham had told Shem and Japheth about the nakedness of his father. When we examine this in the Hebrew, literally the ancient Hebrew says that Ham told with delight what he saw in his father's tent. He determined to mock his father and undermine his authority as a man of God. There's a lot of that in society today, but he told it with delight. Instead of being a covering that we see right here. The other two, his brothers, were that covering. We are called to be a covering. Husbands, be a covering for your wife. Cover your wife. Cover your children. Cover one another in the body of Christ. Be a covering. And you'll find that you're more like the other two brothers, but not like Ham. Now, likely you recall one who has offended you. Love on them. One who is repulsive to you. Love on them. Look on the screen at Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Or Romans 5, 8. But God demonstrates his own love towards us. He demonstrates. He doesn't just say, I love you. He demonstrates it. He shows it. It's active. And that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still sinners. Or how about in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God and dear children, as dear children. And walk in love. I love this verse. As Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. In other words, our example is Christ. Follow the example of Christ. Sacrificial love, a walk of love, a demonstration of love, the action of love. Here it says, furthermore, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Look at this verse again. And walk in love as Christ has, or also has loved us. Walk in love. And has given himself for us an offering, a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. It's sweetness before God. It rises up to the nostrils of God as a sweet-smelling aroma when we walk in love. We're not going to change the world with hate. We're not going to change the world with being angry or peace. As I said Wednesday night, we're not going to change the world with our politics. Politics has its place. It does. Well, you're not going to change the world with politics. Politics isn't going to save one soul. Politics can't redeem an individual. It has its place. But people don't need your politics. 
People need the person of Jesus Christ. That's what you needed. That's what, I, that's what we need. Present tense. Walk in love. Christ is the demonstration. What a high bar has been set before us. Back in 1 Thessalonians, verse 13. So that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. By the way, if you are a man, woman, youth of God, you're a saint. I like to say you're either a saint or you ain't. A saint is all who are born again, Holy Spirit-filled believers in Jesus Christ. You're a saint. I can look out here and I can see there's St. John over there. Oh, that sounds too holy. That sounds too whatever. Let's find a, another one, you know. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, St. Teresa. Well, that's kind of like Mother Teresa. I don't know. You know, I don't know. St. Levi. Maybe that's good, you know. St. Russ. Yeah, we don't read of Russ in the Bible. So, you know, St. Russ, you know, you're a saint cool thing, you know, to be a saint. Really? I'm a saint. I'm a saint. It's a cool thing. Establish your hearts blameless. Not sinless. It's not saying sinless. It's different between, it's not saying we're, we're sinless. Blameless. Blameless. Christ in his love lets us come before him, lets us bring our sins before him, and he does that work of sanctification in our lives. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. I'm going to wrap this up here in just a few minutes. Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15. It says, and you, being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. He took the death, spiritual death, and made you alive. With him, together with him, having forgiven all or forgiven you all trespasses. Next verse. Having wiped out the handwriting of the requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Nailed it to the cross. Our sins nailed to the cross. Nailed. Dealt with. Having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them. Triumphing over them in it. That's our God. That's our God. That's what he has done for us, that's what he's done for you and me, that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God. You know, God's doing a work in your life right now, whether you see it or not, whether you recognize it or not. He's doing a work in your life. He's establishing your heart, establishing you in holiness before God. He says, be ye holy for I'm holy. He wants to make you holy. And that's the work of God. He does it through his written word. He does it through the working, in working of his Holy Spirit in us. Holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. The greatest question of all is, are you a saint of God? Will you be coming with the Lord on that appointed day? You're either a child of God or you're not. There's no in between. There's no purgatory. It is nowhere in God's word. The word is not in God's word. The concept is nowhere in God's word. It's not there. It's an invented thing by the Catholic Church. It is not a part of God's word. Will you be coming with the Lord 
on this appointed time, the Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Are you a child of God? Have you allowed God to just do that working in your life because of his great love for you? He knows that you need him. He knows that I need him. And have you truly called out to him? Like truly gotten serious and said, Lord, I need you. That man shall not live by bread alone, it says in Deuteronomy, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word that proceeds from his mouth. That we are not called to live by bread alone. We probably had, I had bread this morning. I, I, now it's three times this week I've burnt bread. It's, it's a shame, but you know, I just, I, you can't, you know, I, it was frozen, you know, and I put it in the microwave and I thought, okay, I'm going to put a 50%, you know, power to kind of like defrost it. I put it in there for two minutes and it was kind of like a hockey puck then, you know. <laughs> and then I took it from there and I put it into the toaster and then just, <laughs> it's bad. I, I'm so bad about this, you know. It's, it is so wrong. And my family makes so much fun of me and I, I don't know. And then I was blaming the toaster oven and Jeremy had no part of that either. And, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Like I said to him, what am I supposed to do? Put this thing in there and just watch it cook? Like who wants to, that's like watching grass grow. Who wants to do that? You know, I don't know. But he's doing a work. He's doing a work in our lives. And he wants to use us and then work through us. The inworking of his Holy Spirit and the outworking of his Holy Spirit. And then when there's the outworking of his Holy Spirit, then there needs to be more filling. When I partake of that food, you know, but I need more food. I need that food. It gives me strength. And I need his word to give me strength. I need his spirit to give me strength. We need to depend on him even more than we depend on those things in the physical realm. We need to depend on him. I pray that that speaks of you this morning. Trust him. Christian, trust him. Walk that walk of faith. We'll talk about that a little bit next week. Walk that walk of faith and love others. What if, what if think about this, what if we loved others the way that Christ loved me, loves me. Wow. Wow. That is life-changing for everybody involved. So do it. Do it. Start today. You'll never regret it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we are called to walk in your love, to walk in your grace. To the filling and indwelling of your Holy Spirit in our lives. How wonderful and beautiful it is to trust you, to serve you. To say, Lord, if you could love a sinner like me, a holy God loving an unholy person, a sinner, then Lord, then I should love those around me. Love them into the kingdom. Love them in such an encouraging way. The greatest love of all is walking in that love, knowing that love, experiencing that love personally. Christ came that we may have a personal relationship with him. He humbled himself and became a man. Scripture says God is love, but everyone doesn't want God's love, Lord. Everyone doesn't want your love. And Honestly, Lord, that is one thing that I just don't get. I don't understand. But people make that choice to reject you. There are 
There's so many that don't want your love. And there's so many that recognize that there's so much more to this life than the nine to five. Than the difficulties and hardships. To truly define Christ is to find love. To find meaning. To enter into the most dynamic, personal relationship of all. That which we were truly created for was to have fellowship with God, to walk with God, to cry out to God. Lord God, we need you. Lord, we sing that song, we need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour, every minute, every millisecond, Lord God, how can my heart beat without the creator of heaven and earth that causes it to do so. May our hearts beat to the glory of God. Strengthen your church, Lord, we pray. And perhaps you're here this morning and you want what you see so many of us in this place have. I want to have that faith. I want to have that love. I want to have the most dynamic relationship of all. I want to know and understand why I was created, that I was created for God. Perhaps the Holy Spirit is moving upon you right now. Will you call out to God? Will you put your trust in Him? Scripture makes it clear that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Scripture also says that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the Father but by Him. Would you like to leave this place today knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are a child of God, that you are a saint, that you have been forgiven, that if the Lord were to require your life of you today, that you could walk out of this place knowing, I will be with the Lord. You can have that assurance. Today, if this is you, will you put your faith in Jesus Christ? Today, if this is you, would you just agree along with me in prayer? Lord Jesus, just pray these words right now. Pray these words, Lord Jesus. Repeat these words, Lord Jesus. Forgive me, a sinner. I come before you today. And I ask, oh Lord, come into my life. Make me new. I confess you as my Savior. I confess you as Lord. And I put my trust in you. Come into my life. Make me new. May your Holy Spirit indwell me. Change me from the inside out. Lord, I ask for your forgiveness of my sins. I turn from them. I turn to you. And I give you thanks. Lord, praise and thank you for that work that you're doing here the lives of so many. And Lord, we pray for all the rest of us that we would walk worthy of the call. That we would walk in your joy and that we would love literally on everyone who you bring into our life. Love them in the name of Jesus. Love them into the kingdom of God. That they see what we have. 
and that they want it. Strengthen your church, Lord. We look forward to what you're going to do. We praise you, and we thank you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name, and all God's church said amen and amen. Let's all